We're going to take another look at the rate of radioactive decay, but this time we're going to look at it in terms of what's called the decay constant. So in the last lesson, we learned about this expression here. Uh, we're going to come up with a new expression today, which will actually model exactly the same thing. So it'll say that the number of radioactive particles will be equal to the number that you started with, times e to the negative lambda t, where this lambda is called the decay constant. So you'll recall that uh, the number of decays is always proportional to the number of particles. In other words, if you got more particles, you get more decays. So we can express this idea by saying that the activity will be proportional to the number of particles. Now activity is simply the number of decays, delta n, per unit time. So the number of decays per unit time will be proportional to the number of particles. Now, if you're familiar with calculus, you probably know that you could write that as the derivative of n with respect to t will be proportional to n. Now, whenever you have a proportional relationship between two quantities, you can always write it as an equality by putting in a proportionality constant. And that is that dn dt would be equal to some constant, which will be the decay constant, times the number of particles. Now, properly expressed, we should put a negative sign here. The number of particles is always decreasing. Uh, I prefer to just put in an absolute value sign to say that the magnitude of the rate of decay will equal a constant called the decay constant times the number of particles. So this is really a function, n, that looks the same way in its derivative. And so what function is its own derivative? Well, of course, it's e to the x. The derivative of e to the x with respect to x is e to the x. So we need a function that is its own derivative. And I'll let you work out the details, but this is the function that works. So very briefly, if I take this expression here, I've got n equals n naught e to the negative lambda t, and I take the derivative of both sides, then I'll get dn dt equals negative lambda n0 e to the negative lambda t, which is negative lambda n. So this equation satisfies this equation here. Now, is there a physical meaning to this, this proportionality constant? It turns out there is a physical meaning. And what I'm going to do is take this expression here and multiply both sides by delta t. So I'm just going to get delta n equals lambda n delta t. Now I'm going to divide both sides by n. So I'm going to divide this side by n and this side by n. And of course, I'm just going to get that delta n all over n is going to equal lambda delta t. And I'm being a little lazy. I'm forgetting my absolute value signs because I'm just working with magnitudes. Now I'm going to divide both sides by delta t. So I'm going to divide here by delta t and here by delta t. And so the expressions I'm now going to get are delta n all over n. Big division line over delta t is equal to just lambda itself. I'll put my absolute value signs in there again. But what you can see here, this here, that's the fraction of particles that have decayed. And this here is per unit time. So this expression here for lambda, lambda is the fraction of particles that decay per unit time. Or we could say it's the probability of decay per unit time. So lambda is the probability of decay per unit time. Now, we have to be a little bit careful when we're using this expression or this definition of lambda because we're really assuming that everything in this equation is constant. And of course, the number of particles will change if you wait too long. If you wait for a period of time that's significant compared to the half-life, then of course, n's going to change and it won't be constant. So n cannot change for this expression. And that simply means that t has to be a lot less than the half-life in order for you to, to employ this equation here successfully.
we've got this decay constant. Before we had this half-life, there should be some sort of relationship between the two. And it's a fairly simple relationship. We know the number of particles from our two expressions has to be the same. So whether we write that in terms of a half as your base, or we write that in terms of e as your base, you still got to end up with the same number of particles. So we can start doing a little bit of cancellation. And then our next step will be to take the ln of both sides. So I'm going to take the ln of this expression, the ln of 1 half to the t all over t. And I'll take the ln of this one as well. And hopefully you remember your rules for logarithms. The ln of something base e is always just the exponent, so we get negative lambda t on this side. Over here, I'm going to write that a little differently. I'm going to write this uh, 1 over 2 is the same as 2 to the minus 1. So I could write this as 2 to the negative t all over the half-life. So we get a ln 2. I can bring the exponent out front, negative t all over the half-life equals negative lambda t. I can get rid of those negative signs on both sides. I can cancel out a t here and here. And so I get my expression for lambda here as just ln 2 divided by the half-life. And that equation's in your data booklet. Basically, if you know the half-life, you know the decay constant. If you know the decay constant, you know the half-life. Okay, a typical IB question. What I'd like you to do is pause the video, try the question, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so for the decay constant, we're just going to plug in ln 2 divided by the half-life, so it's 0 0.693, that's the ln of 2. Uh, t here, it's 8.84 minutes. And so we get an expression for lambda as being 0 0.0784. I'll take it to three significant digits since I have three significant digits here. And the units, that would be minutes to the minus 1. So the units for decay constant are always reciprocal time units. Now to get the activity of the sample after 12 minutes, remember that activity is always proportional to n. So in my expressions n equals n0 e to the negative lambda t, I can always replace the n's by the a's because they're proportional. And that's what I'm going to do. And in fact, I can use either of my expressions. I can either go and use the lambdas, or I could use the halves as well. Either one will work, and I've got all the information for either one of them. I'm going to take the first one here. My initial, my initial activity was 124 Becquerel. A Becquerel is just a decay per second. So this is 124 decays per second. E to the negative. Lambda is 0 0.0784 minutes to the minus 1. And that will get multiplied by 12 minutes. So just make sure in your exponent, whatever your units are for time here, they have to be reciprocal units for your half-life here. So that the units cancel out in the exponent. If you multiply that out, you should get an answer of 48.4 Becquerel, or decays per second. Pause the video, take a few minutes to think about this one, and then come back for the answer. So what we're reading here is really a definition of what a decay constant is. So what is the probability that a radioactive nucleus with a half-life of one minute will decay within one second? And the answer would be the probability would equal the decay constant, lambda. And notice here that if your half-life is one minute, then one minute is quite long compared to one second. So we have satisfied that condition that the number of particles will roughly stay constant during that time interval. So what I'd like you to do again is to read the question over, try it out, and then come back for the answer.
Okay. So hopefully you started with the idea that activity is equal to lambda times n. That is the number of decays per second is proportional to the number of particles. And so we can write that for both substance s, so I'll put in my s subscripts, we can also say it for substance t. And then if I divide those two expressions, on this side it tells me the two activities are the same. That means this has to be equal to 1 equals lambda s over lambda t times ns over nt. And that means that nt all over ns will simply be the reciprocal of the lambdas or lambda t all over lambda s and that would be answer c. Now how do we measure half-lives experimentally? Well we'd use a Geiger counter or some other radiation detector. Geiger counter has a, uh, a certain area opening here and it would register the number of counts per second that enter the detector here. Now when you're using a Geiger counter you have to establish a background count rate first and you always subtract off that background so that you're only looking at radiation from your source. So if you've got a source over here and your detectors back here say, and the radiation's coming out, then first thing we have to do is subtract off the background. So you subtract off the background. Now activity is always going to be proportional to the number of counts received by the Geiger counter, but you could also get the number of decays if you sort of imagine a big sphere which would have an area here of 4 pi r squared, where r is the distance between the sample and the detector, then what we would do if we wanted to find out the number of decays per second is we'd take the total surface area, divide it by the area of the detector, and then multiply that by the number of counts per second that you're receiving at the detector. So by doing that we can get decay rate now if you were trying to find out a very short half-life, what you'd use is a Geiger counter, but it would be connected uh, to a computer which would be able to make readings very, very quickly, perhaps um, at intervals of a millionth of a second. And what you would do is perhaps let your Geiger counter count for maybe a hundredth of a second, 0 0.01 seconds. And then you would watch what happens to the activity and let's say the activity went down by a factor of 8 in 0 0.01 seconds. That would mean that three half-lives are equal to 0 0.01 seconds and then you can just divide by 3 to figure out what the half-life must have been. In other words, what you're basically doing is you're taking a time from this curve, plugging in Plugging it into this expression, you know the initial count rate, you know the count rate at time t, that means you're going to be able to solve for the half-life here. Now, it's very different if you've got a very long half-life, you certainly don't want to wait around for 5,000 years for the activity to become half as big. So what you can do is, if I start with this expression here and I take the ln of both sides, I'm going to get that ln of a equals the ln of a0 e to the negative lambda t. Then we're going to use our rules for logarithms and I've got a product so that means I'm going to get the ln of a0 plus the ln of e to the negative lambda t and that's going to come out to be ln of a equals ln of a0 minus lambda t. Now as this guy's pointing out think in terms of y equals mx plus b. In other words, we can imagine this ln of a being our y variable. This thing here, the ln of the initial count rate, that's a constant. So we can think of that as being our y-intercept b. This t, that would be like our x variable, and negative lambda, that's going to be our slope m. So what's going to happen if we do a plot of our y variable, which is ln a, 
against our x variable, which is t, then the slope of this line is going to equal negative lambda. Of course, once we've got lambda, then we can get the half-life as well. We're going to have to detect the radiation for quite a long time before we see some sort of decrease in the activity, but we should be able to get that slope, figure out what that slope is, uh, without having to wait too much time. Now, in certain circumstances, if you've just prepared, in a sense, a uh, sample of radioactive particles, then you might actually know the initial number of particles. And if you know the initial number of particles, then you can use the idea that dn dt has to equal lambda times n. So if you know the number of particles and you know the activity, then of course you can figure out what lambda is and then use lambda to get t. Okay, and we have another question here. Once again, I'd like you to read the question over, try it for yourself, and then come back for the answer. Okay, in part A, we know the half-life. That means we can immediately get the decay constant. It'll equal the ln of 2 divided by 6, which comes out to be, and that's 6 hours, so our decay constant will be 0 0.11. I'm going to keep a few extra decimal places because I'm going to have to carry these numbers through later on in the problem. And the units there are hours to the minus 1. Now, in part B, I want the initial activity. Now, I know the decay constant. And in this particular one, I know the number of atoms. So I can use the idea that the activity should equal lambda times the number of particles. So lambda is 0 0.1152. That's hours to the minus 1. The number of particles is... 1.0 times 10 to the 24th and that's going to give me my initial activity. Just be careful because that's going to be particles per hour. Now in part C, uh, notice the amount of time is 12 hours. That means we've got two half-lives and so hopefully you recognize that in two half-lives you get a one quarter of the number of particles. In other words, we're going to start off with 1.0 times 10 to the 24th particles and we've got to divide by 2 squared or divide by 4. And that should give you 2.5 times 10 to the 23rd uh, particles that will be remaining. Those are the radioactive particles remaining after six uh, after 12 hours. And then in part D, this time it's 30 minutes. Make sure you make the conversion to hours because your decay constant and half-life are in hours, so that's going to be 0 0.5 hours. And so we can use either expression now to get the number of particles. Let's use this expression. So it's uh, we're starting off with 1.0 times 10 to the 24th particles, and we'll have E decay constant 0.11552, and you've got to multiply that by 0.5 hours, and when you do that, you should get an answer of 9.4 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Okay, another question. Once again, read the question over, try it yourself, and then come back for the answer. Okay, for this question here, first thing you want to notice is you're only getting 16 decays in a minute, and you're starting off with uh, a large number of particles, 10 to the 16th particles, and you're only getting 16 decays. That means you have a very, very long half-life, and that means that you can use the idea that the half-life will be equal to delta n all over n per unit time. And so we're getting 16 decays out of 1.5 times 10 to the 16 particles. And that's all occurring in one minute. So that's 60 seconds. And if you make that calculation, you should get the answer that suggested 1.8 times 10 to the minus 17 seconds to the minus 1. So make sure you make the conversion to seconds here. Now, in part B, they're just asking you for the half-life. So the half-life will be given by ln 2 divided by the decay constant, or 0 0.693 divided by 1.8 
times 10 to the minus 17. And since your decay constant is in seconds to the minus 1, your half-life is going to be in seconds, and that should come out to be 3.9 times 10 to the 16th seconds. A little note on the uh, equations that are given to you for nuclear physics in the IB data booklet. Notice, first of all, that they do not give you this expression in terms of the half-life. So if you want to use that expression, you need to remember it. Okay, but they do give you the other expression here in terms of the decay constant. And they do tell you the relationship between the decay constant and the half-life. They also give you the basic definition of activity. Activity is simply the number of particles that decay per unit time. And they also give you this here. Uh, the first part of this expression is really just saying that uh, delta n delta t equals lambda n. Which is to say, which is to say that the number of decays that you get per second is proportional to the number of particles that you have. And now summarizing the results, we've now got a new equation for decay in terms of the decay constant. We can relate this new decay constant to the half-life by this equation. The decay constant itself does have a physical meaning. It's the probability of decay per unit time. So if you had lambda equal to, say, 0.1 seconds to the minus 1, that would mean there was a 10% chance of a particle decaying in any given second. And we also talked about Geiger counters and how we could measure very short half-lives. And we would simply plot the activity versus time, you should get a curve that looks something like this. You can take any point on that curve and plug it into a naught e to the negative lambda t and then solve for lambda. And once you've got lambda, of course, you can get the half-life. Now, if you've got very long half-lives, then you plot the lawn of the activity versus time. The negative of the slope should be equal to the decay constant. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.